All right. So welcome everyone. Um, few items that I have to go through for our regular meetings. One is uh, the Hyperledger uh, Code of Conduct, which means that you basically have to behave on these calls. Even when you disagree with people, please try to be polite. Do not interrupt people uh, unless they are holding forth uh, for a long time. Uh, and please attribute um, your ideas if it is coming from the outside or if you are uh, give credit to people and allow uh, time for everyone to talk. That is the hyperledger code of conduct. The second uh, thing is uh, the, and of course it goes without saying that everyone is welcome here. Um, the second thing is the um, hyperledger uh, no, it's actually the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. We we have to abide by that, which means that we do not uh, engage in any anti-competitive uh, behavior. And that is, these are the only two requirements for participating in this call. Uh, you do not have to be a member of Hyperledger or anything like that. It's a completely open call with those two caveats. So before we go into our main event, I, I want to ask um, Kirthi to do a short presentation on the insurance subgroup. And he will uh, talk about that. And the second thing is money will say something about our ongoing efforts in CBDC. And then we go directly to uh, Baxter Hines, who is the um, who's the chief uh, information officer, chief uh, um, officer. Chief investment of, officer. Huh? What was chief it? Investment, investment officer. officer. Investment officer of uh, dig, uh, Honeycomb Digital Investments. Uh, and he has written a book, which will be coming out soon on John Wiley. It's going to be very uh, interesting because it talks about digital finance and how Things are going to be shaken up with the uh, stable uh, with uh, security tokens, uh, which can include any variety of uh, digital twins of real world assets. Well, as real as it gets. Anyway, um, so Kirti, please. Thanks, Vipin. Um, just to give you a brief, uh, the Hyperledger Insurance Subgroup. Um, the idea came about um, because we're trying to solve some capital requirements problems in the Lloyd's market. So Lloyd's is a predominant market, which is uh, an insurance market, which is based out of London. And um, it's, it's got a unique subscription model structure and it caters to specialty insurance. Um, when we decided to do this, um, insurance subs group, we felt that there were a lot of synergies with what Capital Markets uh, Special Interest Group was doing. And um, I thought I could possibly uh, take some of the best practices from there and try and use some of those in solving bigger problems which are associated with data um, in the Lloyd's market before we venture into um, DLT and other technologies to solve bigger problems. So. Um, Recently, we kind of looked at um, um, two simple structures which are associated with first steps of um, uh, venturing into distributed ledger technologies. And uh, this is where we talk about things like uh, um, structured data, structured data standards, and, and a bit of parametric analysis to kind of build smart I would say contract documentation that kind of integrates and binds all the ledgers which exist within the um, Lloyd's value chain. So we kind of came up with a, with a very innovative structure. We, it's still work in progress. Uh, we have a long way to go. Um, so I just want to share a couple of screens and, and talk about what we are trying to do. 
Um, so within, um, can I share my screen? Do I have the permission to? I think you should. Okay, great. You should, it's at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so yeah just, guys... just, you know, uh, we were talking about that one uh, screener that you showed me uh, about the uh, contracts and the payments. Um, was it this one? No, the other one which had the uh, market laid out with the two, uh, uh, you know, one was the contracts getting, um, getting oh, okay. securitized. I mean, because it, it naturally flows into the, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Naturally, no, it's the next present into the presentation that uh, Baxter is about to give. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, um, so we're talking about the tokenization of a risk contract, and and this is where we talk about bringing quite a few of the life cycle events together. Um, where I talk about, um, sorry about this. Uh, where I talk about how we are trying to use tokenization to solve some of the problems within the Lloyd's market. So here in the simple diagram, we talk about the journey a risk contract generally takes. A risk contract is uh, facilitated by multiple syndicates. Syndicates are people who take like a fraction of the risk. What we are trying to do here is that you can see we're trying to build like a, a blockchain, uh, a permission blockchain, which is in the corner. Uh, which is uh, literally a set of people working together uh, who are trying to solve problems which are related to payments, capital adequacy, um, anything to do with accounting and settlement and endorsements and claims. So we're trying to kind of solve some of these bigger issues which are associated with um, the Lloyd's market. And when it comes to payments, uh, we are talking about um, how we could use cross-ledger settlements uh, when it comes to, um, we're looking at a customer input process output supplier view. That view simply focuses on looking at two ends of the chain and trying to do cross settlements of payments, premium payments versus how we kind of show the capital adequacy and the availability of capital for solvency. So these are some of the unique problems that we're trying to solve as a part of the, the um, insurance subgroup. Um, I'll, I'll put a better structure to it next time. So within, um, I, I can't find that slide, unfortunately. Hey, it's okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, the main thing yeah. is Kirti is starting this group and uh, uh, there are a bunch of people from Lloyd's uh, who are already on the, uh, on the meeting page. So they, they are, um, wanting to um, you know, uh, create this group and go forward with this uh, effort inside the capital market special interest group. Uh, the next uh, person who I wanted to ask was money to say something about our current uh, efforts in, um, in the uh, CBDC. Uh, which is coming, of course, from the other side, from the payment side. So uh, Baxter understands, you know, that both sides have to be there for a market, a, a security token infrastructure and a, um, and a payments infrastructure. They have to come together. And that is the key uh, to making this happen. So... Um, it's money, do you want to say anything or uh, should I just ask uh, Baxter to go ahead? Um, no, I just want to give a quick update and, um, uh, you know, to the general group uh, in the sense that we did a, 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 an initial presentation of our white paper, uh, I think it's the last month. Um, subsequently, uh, is the, uh, the work we did under the Hyperledger, which is the Ethala project, uh, we did give a presentation to the uh, DCGI, which is the digital currency group, um, um, last again a, a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, again, that's just a, that's a smaller part of the overall effort we are, we are undertaking on the CBDC um, white paper and the, uh, and, and the corresponding work that goes with it. Uh, the, the purpose of this call, I mean, the purpose of why I brought it up is to see if there's anyone has any uh, inputs or uh, comments on the uh, white paper. Uh, and then separately, we also uh, given uh, this to WSBA. Currently, the, the white paper is being given to only, uh, let's say, call the friendly groups. We haven't uh, issued it to the wider circulation yet. Uh, we just want to see within our own uh, groups to see if there's any, anyone has any specific comments. Uh, we also intend to give a, a short presentation on WSBA. I think Ron is there on the line as well. So, you know, uh, hopefully- He's got his can... hand lifted. Always happy to help. Uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, uh, Manny. Yeah, we do. We absolutely do have the white paper. I, I've gone through it with some comments, and I have colleagues doing likewise. Absolutely looking forward to that being presented to uh, the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance membership. So, thank you very much. Yeah, that, that's all. That's all I wanted to bring it up. If you know anyone got comment, you can directly you can you can email us, or you can directly give your comments on the uh, Hyperledger page. Um, so. That's all, it's just a short announcement and, and we will keep continuing working with our fine tuning the paper and you know, uh, based upon inputs. And here is the author of uh, Digital Finance, Baxter Hines himself. Uh, well, thank you so, so very much. I really appreciate uh, you giving me the opportunity to, to speak today. I'm planning on talking for about 30 minutes and, and leaving a lot of time open for, for questions at the end. Just from hearing the last two discussions, it sounds like uh, the audience is very much in tune with some of the topics that um, I'm planning to speak about. So I won't get into uh, extreme details because I don't want uh, to, to, to bore you and get into stuff that you, you already know. But again, uh, it's an honor to be able to, to speak to your group today. And I want to thank Vipin for helping to arrange this and also you know, thank him for being a thought leader in this space. I, I think he's put out some incredible articles that have been easy for the overall uh, community that's that's interested in this space to to explore and to you know to be able to ponder the, the topics that he's written about. So definitely want to want to uh, give him a, a shout out for that. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, with you. I believe everybody has gotten a copy of the presentation, or maybe Vipin, you're going to send that out uh, afterwards. Um, but this slide, I'm just going to uh, be going through the slide deck as, as, I, as I speak and uh, planning on leaving plenty of time for questions at, at the end. Just a little bit about me and how I got into this space. I come from the traditional asset management side. For the last 12 years, I was a portfolio manager for a company called Allianz, which is the largest insurance company in Europe. I was uh, a member of a, a team here in Dallas. Uh, I was one of six portfolio managers. We oversaw about $45 billion of assets. We were long only uh, equity managers. We bought dividend paying stocks for our clients, which included institutions like endowments or foundations. Uh, we managed several mutual funds as well as some separately managed accounts for high net worth individuals. So that's what I, I did really for the last 12 years. I realized through some of my studies in cryptocurrencies that the underlying technology behind Bitcoin and other uh, mechanisms like Ethereum was going to be revolutionary to the financial industry and was going to allow for a much better, faster, cheaper way of doing business. And it was going to start having huge impacts on real world assets like stocks, bonds, private assets and, and the like. And so I wanted to learn as much as I could. I also earlier in my career had worked for Reuters in the financial uh, information business. And so I understood both the, you know, how the business on the, the asset management side was, was run, as well as understood a lot of the technical aspects of, of you know, how the back office uh, was all put together. So that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a little bit about, uh, about me. Uh, I also, as Vipin had mentioned, have a book coming out uh, next month. Uh, John Wiley and Sons will be publishing it, and it's going to be released uh, in, in retail channels throughout the world. Uh, the book is called Digital Finance, Security Tokens, and Unlocking the Real Potential of Blockchain. Uh, the reason I wrote it was because I felt that many people who 
knew about blockchain really focused more on crypto. Uh, they were confused about a lot of the topics and the ideas uh, in this new and exciting technology. And so I wanted to partner with a large uh, publisher like John Wiley and Sons to, to really um, create something that would, would create a uh, clear and concise framework about how to think about investments in the digital space. And the goal here was really to help readers uncover how blockchain and distributed ledger technology were going to disrupt the financial industry in a non-technical way. Uh, that would, uh, and, 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 and in a way that was very easy for people to understand. So I decided to really focus more on the benefits of the technology rather than getting into sort of the nitty gritty and really getting down into the weeds, letting people really understand why this was going to benefit them and how it would affect uh, their job. I would say it's, it's more about, uh, you know, letting someone learn about an automobile behind the wheel and how to get from point A to point B rather than, than getting up under the hood. That's probably the best analogy. Uh, in which I can can uh, explain it. So I, I covered things like cryptocurrency, the uh, digital currencies, the CBDCs, stable coins. But the meat of the book is about security tokens and how they are going to uh, start to impact these real world assets in a very positive way and create all kinds of new opportunities uh, for investment. So in the book, I go into a lot more depth on several of the topics that I was going to uh, touch upon today. Uh, again, the, the book is available on pre-order uh, on Amazon and will be in bookstores on November 17th. So with that, let me just uh, jump into the, the main part of the discussion today uh, on uh, you know, blockchain and its disruptive effects on the uh, financial industry. The first thing I wanna just say is this, there's no investment advice here. All of this is for educational uh, purposes only. I've got some slides in the appendix, in particular, uh, that discuss you know all of those those disclaimers. There's also some more information on me, uh, the contents of this presentation, and some additional uh, slides if you're interested in in, in getting in touch um, later on. So in this uh, presentation, my objective is is really to talk more specifically about how the token of of tokenization of assets is going to affect and alter the way that we issue, manage, and trade our securities, uh, and, uh, and really to get into you know, what is unfolding, why it's important, and how this technological advancement is going to have widespread and ramifications for uh, real-world assets. Okay, so I'm gonna head here to, to slide five. You know, what's really exciting to me is that this whole uh, new technology of blockchain is really having incredible effects on connecting projects with the capital that they need. Um, it sounds like you all are fairly up, up to speed on tokenization from the last two uh, people that, that, that spoke on this call. You know, I really think of, of uh, security tokens as a digital representation of real ownership in an asset. You know, one token is equivalent to one share of an asset or, or one bond in, 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 a, in a specific fixed income issue. It's really all else equal, just as, as uh, simple as that. And so we're seeing the digitization of securities. It's, gonna, it's set to be a, a global mega trend that's soon going to, to be one of the biggest business opportunities worldwide. So we feel like everyone in the financial industry will need to have a broad comprehension of how the technology works, uh, what it can affect, and what the consequences are going to be for business. And I, I believe truly that most people who are in the financial industry they're aware of Bitcoin, they're aware of other cryptocurrencies, but they are totally oblivious to the far greater potentials of blockchain. And so since we are in the early innings of a large secular opportunity to embrace blockchain technology and bridge both the traditional and digital worlds, we need to have ways in which to educate uh, the, the, the broader population on why they need to continue to uh, adopt this technology. And just as we saw in the late 1990s, when investors started moving to web-based platforms to obtain better and more up-to-date news flow or to obtain cheaper trade executions, we're going to start seeing similar types of moves towards blockchain-based solution. That's, that's my uh, honest uh, belief. Just because, again, the, the benefits of the technology itself are really going to uh, be what sells the, sells this product. Uh, you're delivering much better functionality, scalability, and overall performance if we can get uh, 
you know, buy in and, and start utilizing the right types of, of, of technologies to solve uh, these, these, these problems. And what's really great about this is that our current financial system is, is fairly antiquated, especially when it comes to private assets and, and other uh, more uh, exotic types of, of, uh, of investment opportunities. And so th this mechanism is going to really provide a lot of efficiencies and will cut out a lot of, uh, of, of costs and, and, and frictions that uh, will just create a much, much better overall financial system. So uh, one of the things that I have here on this slide are just some of the asset classes that I believe will be affected first in the, um, in the tokenization of assets. Uh, and again, earlier in the call, we had alluded to payments. That's a, a whole other sort of branch of, of, of how we're seeing it unfold. We do think, as, as Dippin said, you've got to have both payments and security tokens in place in order for the, for the uh, ecosystem to, to work uh, at its fullest. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking at those kind of separately, but then again, in the big, big scheme of things, you've got to have, have everything there uh, to work. So, you know, one thing that I, I often mention to people about security tokens and uh, how they are different from, from cryptocurrencies, one of the first things that I mentioned is that these are regulated uh, financial instruments. And, but what's different about a security token from a traditional uh, paper-based certificate that, that represents something real is that you have the speed and agility of the blockchain in which you can move things around. And so inherently they become more tradable and easier to move because of these additional features and they have uh, so many fewer frictions. And what's great about this is that almost anything of value, whether it be real estate, commodities, art, intellectual property, uh, it can be used um, and, and it, as, as, a, as a, a backing for a security token. So, so it's extremely um, exciting that you can, you can create these security tokens and embed in them all kinds of automated world-class investor protections, regular, regulatory compliance, uh, and, cons and consumer uh, servicing uh, procedures. Uh, and those, those plethora of benefits are really going to drive down costs, they're going to enhance flexibility, and they're going to open up all kinds of new business models and revenue streams uh, for companies and, and endeavors throughout the world. So I have here on slide six a, um, a very interesting case study that was just uh, created and, and issued earlier in the year. Uh, the Brooklyn Nets point guard, Spencer Dinwiddie, is a really uh, avid technology fan. And he is really infatuated with the whole blockchain technology. He decided that he wanted to issue bonds based on his credit worthiness on the blockchain. He has a $13.5 million a year, three-year contract with the Nets. He's using that basically as his, uh, you know, his credit worthiness. Uh, the contract itself is not what's backing the bond. But given that these are guaranteed contracts from an NBA franchise, he's a very credit worthy type of, of of issuer, and he's going to pay the investors a 5% type of yield. Now, what's exciting about this blockchain opportunity to Spencer and to, and to the overall investment community is that, number one, this is a kind of, of endeavor that most investors would not be able to uh, easily get access to. Um, with interest rates around the world being very low and with uh, all the volatility in the stock market, people are looking for new kinds of alternative places in which to put their money. And, you know, 5% interest rate from a uh, NBA player is, is not a bad type of alternative in, uh, in this kind of, of market today. Also for Spencer, he wants to eventually start his own uh, fan engagement type of, of trading platform on the blockchain. This was a good way for him to get started and to do a, a proof case. And also Spencer, you know, his primary job is to play basketball for the Brooklyn Nets. He doesn't want to be worried about all the compliance mechanisms that are required and the responsibilities of, of, of those bonds are put on the issuer, i.e. him. He wants to have an automated system that can take care of all that for him. So like, for example, I'm an investor in, in some of these bonds. Uh, if I were to want to sell those bonds uh, before the uh, 
the lockup date. So I'm, I'm required to hold them for a year. If I tried to sell them to someone else in a paper-based system, I could probably do that. Uh, but if a regulator were to find that out, it would be on Spencer, not only on me for violating the terms, but, but he, Spencer Dinwiddie, could, could find himself in, into trouble. The blockchain is going to eliminate some of that risk for Spencer. It's going to, going to prevent me or whoever else owns these bonds from selling them before uh, the appropriate time. And it's also going to uh, make sure that if we do sell them uh, at a later date, that we sell them to appropriate people who have been uh, properly vetted from a compliance standpoint. Uh, they're, they are not money laundering. They are, um, we appropriately know who our customers are, so to speak, KYC. All of that can be automated by the blockchain. And then also, it's very easy to have a custodian, in this case, Paxos Trust, uh, maintain all the tokens and, and disperse all of the, the appropriate payments investors uh, through stable coins. So that's, uh, this, this is just one case study to me that shows the, uh, the creativity element that can be applied to the blockchain and can also um, sh just shows the, 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 the potential and it, it's, a, it's a given use case of how this is now something that's currently being offered to investors and, and is proving that the blockchain technology is something that, that, that can work for uh, issuing these these specific types of securities. So other elements of, of uh, that, that blockchain can can help out on, you know, we've talked about uh, payments earlier in the call. We think that's a very interesting kind of uh, of, of way for um, blockchain to lower costs and the like. Uh, I won't go into too much detail because it sounds like um, you know you, th this group is is fairly well versed in that. But um, you know, another simple idea that, that, that has been tokenized and, and is, uh, could, could fall into the store of, of value bucket uh, here on uh, slide seven, the, the Perth Mint in Australia, they just issued uh, security tokens that are backed by gold. So Perth in Western Australia is really the center for the mining industry. There in, in Western Australia, a lot of gold comes out of the ground and the first place it goes is to Perth to be refined. And so for many, many years, the city of Perth has had bolts of gold where they've stored uh, gold for various investors. And now what the Perth Mint has done is said, look, we'll put the gold in our vaults. We'll issue these tokens. Anyone in the world can buy them so long as they are properly uh, KYC, AML, all the, uh, these buyers are legally compliant. We're willing to take their gold, hold their gold, and allow them to trade that gold on the blockchain in a very easy 24 hour a day, uh, seven day a week fashion. So you're seeing all of these new innovative uh, projects coming out that are again, showing the, the, the general population that this technology is for real, that it's something that is, uh, is, is, is here to stay, and it's something that can impact their, uh, their, their daily lives. And so I think, you know, as, as, as these sort of innovative types of, of issues come out, more and more projects will want to come in off of the sidelines. I've had many conversations over the last several months with, uh, with custodians, with uh, exchanges, or, or, or what are called ATS, alternative trading systems. Uh, these are platforms to trade assets. And I, I keep hearing that there are more and more issuers that are looking to use this technology to get to the end investors. And they're very excited about not only uh, being able again to utilize the technology to, to create this better, faster, cheaper way of, of uh, obtaining capital, but they're also just very excited about the number of investors that they can, uh, potentially, uh, can potentially reach out to. So just a quick uh, visualization of, of, of how these assets get tokenized. Uh, you can see here on the left side of the screen, really any financial or real asset. You, you take take those assets, you provide the title of uh, those assets, you get them legally um, structured in a way where the, the title can be moved around easily. You give them over to a tokenization platform, and then that platform will put them on the blockchain and issue those tokens to the appropriate uh, investors. It's a fairly simple concept, uh, all in all. And again, it's 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 something that is getting to be very, uh, very widespread. And, and we think that's gonna be many, many years of growth in this space. Uh, another thing that, that is, is very exciting to me about uh, this uh, uh, security token 
Uh, opportunity is the ability to use, utilize smart contracts. Uh, I just, again, from, from the, the, the first two conversations that we had on the call, I assume most people here are familiar with this concept. Um, so I won't go into the details of how they work. But what is, is really interesting is that, again, you can take uh, a, a given set of rules, predetermined types of, of contractual terms, put that into code, and then have the blockchain itself enforce those uh, types of, 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 uh, of rules and transfer value according to what unfolds um, with it over a given, given span of time. One of the more interesting uh, and easy to understand uh, examples that I, I will tell to people is in the insurance space, uh, there was a, a very innovative product that AXA, the French uh, insurance giant, put out. It was called Fizzy. It was uh, flight insurance. Basically, the way it worked was, let's assume that you, know, you were going to go to Las Vegas sometime uh, next month for a conference. You had a certain schedule. You were expecting to get uh, to Las Vegas at a certain time because of the, uh, the arrangements of your, your flight ticket. And basically, if, if you were not going to get there by a certain time, there was a potential uh, that you would have a monetary loss or there would be a loss of your time, effort, energy if you couldn't, couldn't make meetings because your flight was delayed. What Fizzy allowed you to do was to go in and buy insurance on your flight contract. Uh, you would go in to a website, you would put in your flight details, you would be quoted a certain uh, premium, and you would pay it. And then after that, everything was put into the, to the blockchain. And the blockchain itself would look at the flight schedule that you were supposed to have. And if you landed in your destination city more than two hours after the scheduled time, the blockchain would go ahead and pay you value uh, for, the, uh, for, for that loss that you, that, that you incurred. What I think is really great about that is that the onerous is not on the claimant of the, uh, the insurance contract, the onus is on the blockchain to automate everything. So if you wreck your car, it, uh, it's on you to go to the insurance company to provide documents proving your accident. You've got a hassle with uh, insurance adjusters or with the, the company that's fixing your car. In the case of Fizzy and the flight insurance contract, everything's done on the blockchain. It's all automated. It takes out all kinds of um, time, effort, energy, and headache. Uh, and so I think that's that's really great for in the financial industry that you can uh, relieve a lot of that uncertainty. So the, the benefits of the, of the smart contracts are, are, are very evident. Again, I won't go into too much detail. I'll assume uh, most of this uh, audience knows uh, why this is, is uh, it's so beneficial. But uh, again, very exciting uh, as, as we continue to, to develop this space. <clears throat> And then overall, just the advantage of, di of, of digital securities, you know, to me, I, I keep using that, that phrase, better, faster, cheaper. Uh, not only are we going to see reductions in costs, time, uh, effort, and energy, but there's also going to be the optionality for liquidity because these securities are going to be put on the digital rails, they're going to be placed on the blockchain, and they're going to be easier to, uh, to issue, uh, transfer, and track over time. And so that will create all kinds of, of new liquidity. The reason I think that is exciting, especially uh, given my equity background, is because over the last uh, several decades, the number of companies that are listing their securities on exchanges has been dropping. Uh, for, for a variety of reasons, companies have decided to stay private for longer periods of time and, and not to go uh, onto to exchanges. Uh, actually, in my last, uh, my last job, I worked with a team that ran the largest small cap uh, stock fund in the country. And I had so many conversations over the years with the manager about how his universe of potential stocks was just getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh, over the years. And what's a shame about that is that if you look back over the last, let's say, you know, 75 years or so, small cap stocks have been one of the biggest and best ways for the average investor to accumulate wealth. Let's just take the example of when Microsoft went public in 1986, they had a market cap of somewhere around $250 million. Uh, today, it's a uh, trillion plus type market cap opportunity. 
and hundreds of millions of people around the world have participated in the wealth uh, creation that that company has incurred. If you look at some of the, uh, the unicorn investments today, some of the, 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 the hot new companies that have come up over the last few years, really the people that have gotten rich are not the people who invested in the company post IPO, they're the people who invested in it pre IPO. And so there is the potential for this security token uh, innovation to really change that and to allow smaller investors, more of a retail audience to participate in these, uh, these great new projects that, that, that entrepreneurs and, and corporations are, are creating. So I find that very uh, enticing. What I also find very interesting is again, with this option of liquidity, is that digital assets really can help unlock the, the, the potential for those, uh, those opportunities and lower their costs of, of capital. So whenever you are uh, you know, looking at diff different assets and, and how they trade on the market, there's something called a uh, liquidity premium or a liquidity discount in many cases. Basically, the more liquid an asset is, the cheaper it is for the issuer of, or of that company to, uh, to obtain that, uh, that, that capital. So there's this, um, uh, there's this continuum of liquidity in the market and private investments are the least developed on this front. And therefore, we think we'll see the biggest benefits uh, from tokenization. Um, if we can, if we can start seeing a, a more liquid type of market, and we can, we can maybe discuss in the Q and A how that might work. So I don't know how, how, how much detail you want me to get into on on this, but if we can start having private assets that have a ready exchange where there is the potential for liquidity, you could see the cost of capital falling in a in a massive way for some of these these projects. And what that would do is allow for productive opportunities in the economy to get the money that they need to, uh, to function and to, and to grow. And so today we don't see that in a lot, in a lot of cases and a lot of, the, of, of really good opportunities are, are passed over because there are investors who need liquidity, who want to be able to have the chance to sell their securities at some point in the, the near future. But because they can't, they just totally uh, overlook the space and, and uh, throw it out uh, altogether. So big opportunities here uh, to the financial markets by, by adding liquidity. So, you know, in, in kind of conclusion, I, I don't want to take up too, too much of your time, but we really believe we're in the, the early stages of this digital revolution based on, on blockchain technology. We think there are all kinds of signs of uh, growing adoption. Uh, we think there is more regulatory clarity that's coming into uh, uh, the picture. And what's really exciting to me also is that the infrastructure to deliver this product uh, from start to finish is getting, uh, getting created by some of the best minds uh, in both you know, Silicon Valley and Wall Street. And so as we continue to see that happen, um, you know, there, there will be more and more good use cases and more and more um, you know, proof statements, so to speak, where common investors, institutional investors, will get more comfortable in utilizing this technology. So let, let, me, let me just stop, stop there and, and, uh, and see if we have any questions. Please don't hesitate, guys. Hey, hey Vipin, it's Ron. Baxter, thanks, thanks for that. And um, you and I both share Thompson and Reuters history. It'd be great to catch up at, at some. Absolutely. Um, I do have two quick questions for you, and I agree with the, the hypothesis that you have under, with Honeycomb Digital around um, security tokens really being the, the true benefit ultimately of blockchain and how that evolves global markets and expands the asset base. I want to go back to the Spencer Dinwiddie example. One of the things that we talk about a lot, uh, particularly in our, with our legal colleagues, I think the Spencer offering was a Reg D offering. Um, not That's correct, 506C. Right, which I don't think was filed with exemption, which meant it was not for general solicitation and generally for, for I, I'll use the blanket phrase of accredited investors or high it, that, that's ex That's exactly right. It was only for accredited investors. 
And I think one of the concerns we're trying to understand is that will be a limitation on liquidity over time and that the ultimate goal is that securitized assets be made to general market participants. What are your thoughts about that? And what are those challenges uh, going forward? Yeah, sure. So I think that there are different kinds of assets that um, can be, be uh, uh, restricted to certain types of, of, of investor bases. Um, you know, you've got different reg A where crowdfunding can, can be the, the, the mechanism by which the, the, the promoter of the project raises capital. That is going to be more for general investors or you have sort of these, again, reg D investments where it's going to only be available to uh, the, general, the general public. Um, so the, the first thing that I would say is you are starting to see the SEC kind of rethink what it wants to do in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the whole accredited investor definition. Uh, they're, they're thinking about lessening that in some, some ways. We're not there yet, but I do think that a lot of securities will start being issued by this, this, uh, this Reg A and, 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 and crowdfunding type of, uh, of, of, of platforms here through, through the blockchain technology. Um, so, so I think that's, that's a big deal. I think also you, you will start seeing more uh, institutional money coming into this space, which will uh, create, again, all kinds of, 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 di of different uh, liquidity. And then there are different jurisdictions around the world that will let you do uh, different things with your uh, tokens. I think that in the end, as we get more and more scale behind uh, this industry, the cost of, of issuing these, these tokens will decrease, as will uh, the risk. And so some of these smaller kinds of uh, you know, public companies and the like will be able to go, go, go to market. So I think there's going to be a, a wide array of different opportunities that, that retail investors uh, can get, get involved in. And it's certainly going to be more than what, they're, uh, what they have available today. Thank, thank you, Baxter. And if I could just add one more question, Vipin, if, if you'll all uh, permit me. Um, given the world a lot of us come from, Baxter, this, the, the idea of interoperability, which in many regards is a technical issue in the blockchain world, uh, is also a product or a use case issue in, in, in global markets, right? You and I could buy IBM in one market, sell it in another by, by way of example, for the most part. Mm -hmm. Are there challenges around interoperability between different platforms and different markets in security token offerings down the road? And like, what needs to happen to evolve that marketplace? Yeah, no, that, that's definitely a, a great question. I mean, I think right now where these, uh, these technologies are fairly dispersed, um, you, you've got, um, it's still a relatively immature type of, of, uh, of just total offering technologically, there's a lot of development that, that needs to be done. But I think over time, you'll start to see more standards written. You'll have to have different protocols. You'll have different, um, you know, just again, kind of cookie cutter type of of uh, applications. Really, it will uh, make it so that investors are more, more comfortable that if these uh, tokens have those certain, again, standards embedded into them, uh, that they'll be easier for, for them to, to, to move around. Great. Thank you, Baxter. Anyone else? Don't be shy. All right, I'll go with one more Vipin if I could. <laughs> yes, I know that you're not shy. I, I, yeah, I know. He, he knows that too much about me, uh, Baxter. I, I, one of the other challenges that, I wouldn't call it a challenge, you did mention Paxos and you mentioned um, broadly the topic of custodianship. Um, a lot of the investment world that we all know are required to leverage qualified custodial organizations. Um, What's the situation for qualified custodians in the, in the security token offering world? And what are your thoughts about how that evolves in the future as well? Sure. I mean, I feel like that segment of the market is moving at just warp speed. So when I started talking with my, uh, my, my current business partner, Dave Baran, about starting this business, Honeycomb Digital, uh, you know, the, the first thing that came up was you can't even custody Bitcoin. Right. right. Uh, and um, we were talking to lawyers back in, August of last year on this topic. And what, what they said was, well, there's, there's really, there's just nothing. I mean, you, you can't, there's no one that, that can, can do this. 
within about three, four months, you know, they started custodying Bitcoin. Then a couple months later, it was Ethereum. Then it was, you know, a, a huge slew of all other kinds of, of, uh, of assets. Now you've got custodians like BitGo that can custody any kind of ERC-20 token. Now you've got a, uh, as the, the holder of it, you may have to call them a few days before you buy and say, hey, I'm looking to, to, to purchase this token. Here's the, here are the proper identifiers for it. Make, just make sure that you can, you can put it in your, your vaults. They can handle that. Uh, they're custodians now that are looking to uh, hold additional uh, uh, chains or, or tokens from, from other, other chains. I think that is coming. You know, if you, it, it, to me, if I think about custody, the hardest part about custody, obviously, is the, is the regulatory part. But the other piece is, if you look at something like Bitcoin versus a security token, Bitcoin and these other cryptos, they're bearer assets. So if you lose those tokens, it's a, it's a, a big problem. That's a problem if you lose the security tokens, but since they're registered, uh, it's much harder for those to be, be transferred, stolen. So as these custodians have kind of mastered the, the bearer assets, the, 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 the cryptos, it becomes easier for them to handle the stuff that's not really a bearer asset. So I, I think the, the heavy lifting in the custody world has been, uh, has been taken care of. Obviously, a lot more work that needs to be done. But at the same time, I think uh, we're on a trajectory where, uh, again, the really bright minds are, are tackling this problem. And so I, I think uh, you know, we're, we're really getting up to speed quickly. Yeah. And I think the OCC commentary letter allowing for custodianship um, with OCC banks is, is really a turning point. I think, that's, I think you're exactly right. The other project that I would, would mention uh, the DTCC, the Depository Trust Clearing Corporation, which handles a lot of the, or most of the, the, the private assets and, and public, really all securities here in the United States. They have uh, something called Project Whitney, where they are really looking into this space, knowing that uh, this is a revolutionary technology and blockchain. They want to get on, on board with it, and they want to make sure that they have a solution um, you know, when the time comes uh, and, and the regulators are uh, and, the, and the market is is ready to, to to move assets over onto the chain. They've got a solution to do it. So I think that's really great to see the market leader uh, really investing a lot of time, effort, energy, and money into you know, making this happen. Yeah. Thank you, Baxter. Great presentation. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So anyone else? Otherwise, I'm going to go. Guys? Am I free to ask Baxter a couple of questions? Uh, I guess so. I'll, I'll keep going if you let me, Vipin, but I'll, I'll step aside for you. <laughs> no, but, you know, I, I, you can go ahead, but I have, you know, just something that strikes at the root of these things. One is, uh, in terms of custodying Bitcoin, uh, any kind of native asset, uh, the only thing you really are talking about is the um, uh, sort of trying to get the private key, uh, you know, um, uh, either in an omnibus wallet or in a personal wallet to, to custody that key and to make sure that uh, that key can be either uh, reclaimed by using some other means, anyway. Let's not go into the details, but the difference between that kind of asset and asset like Dimity's uh, contract backing a uh, security token is the fact that that is a collateral that exists outside the chain. So now you get into a situation where uh, if Dimity, uh, let's say, defaults on his uh, payments, uh, there is nothing, you know, what what can be done in terms of the perfectibility of a, a claim against uh, the basic asset, which is his contract, because that's what that's what will uh, determine this for every everything that is exists in the real world, which is tokenized, uh, and that's that's the question that you know. Very difficult to answer for me, anyway. No, I think you're right. I think you know the 
security tokens are really only as good as the, the you know the custodian or or whoever is you know backing the 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 asset will that entity you know provide that asset over to you if if uh, you know this the, the owner demands it and like you said if there's a smart contract or there's some kind of uh, um, you know, a default, you know, has proper collateral been put up and it, is it accessible to that custodian or in, in, in the end to the eventual owner, uh, the rightful owner uh, of, of, of that asset. So no, I, I think those, those are questions that, that, that have, to be, um, have to be settled. I mean, in some ways it's, it's not really that different to me than, than the system that we're, you know, we're, we're already in. Um, yes. You know, so I, I again, I think in terms of the the efficiencies that you gain from you know quicker settlement, cheaper cost of transfer, all of those things. I mean, we're definitely in a we would definitely be in a better place than we are today. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it, it, you know I, th I think that's you know the angle that I, I would, would would approach it from. Yeah, um, so that's that's one of the uh, uh, things that are problematic with this. So Money's uh, got his hand up, so I, I'm going to let him speak about this. Uh, uh, I mean, let him ask a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Baxter. For, uh, it is a great presentation. Uh, what is your opinion from the buy side? Essentially, you, you represent the institutional side of things. We hear from the custodian, from the issuers. How does the investor, uh, particularly the, from the capital market side of things, view this new opportunity? Sure, I think like anything, there's a, a, a skeptical view that, that people have at first. I mean, you know, when I talk about blockchain and, and the, you know, the effects that it's going to have on the, on the industry, the first thing that, most, that comes to most people's mind is, oh, you must be dealing in cryptocurrency. And I say, well, you know, that's a little bit of what we're doing, but really it's, it's, it's about these real world assets that are, you know, going on to the chain. And so what I, what I would say, first of all, is most people at this stage in the game aren't even really educated on the, you know, again, that far greater potential of blockchain, this, this security token uh, aspect. Their, their, their mind is still anchored in the, you know, the Bitcoins and the, and the Ethereum, which they, even in that uh, respect, they don't uh, truly understand that, that well. So there's a lot of education that needs to be done in the space. You know, I have talked, though, with a ton of, you know, industry leaders and they, they really get what's going on. And they, you know, it, it takes a little bit of time a lot of times for, for people to understand, but you get kind of the, the light bulb goes off and they go, oh my gosh, I really get why we need to go down this path and how this, is, this opportunity is going to, to unfold. I think that um, there are definitely some, some early movers that are, that are getting into the, to the space in, in, a, in a big way. Um, but I think that, you know, it's going to take time before institutions are going to really start to put, put money into the space. It's going to really be more of a, a grassroots effort to, uh, to get adoption in the, the asset management uh, space. And so, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just like anything, it's, it's, it's going to take time. But, um, you know, there definitely are a lot, of, a lot of green shoots out there. And there are major, you know, corporations that are putting a ton of money in it. I, I, I didn't share the slide during the, the presentation, but uh, when Vipin uh, distributes it to you, you can take a look. There are major corporations, whether it's, you know, uh, you know like you see here Santander, HSBC, um, all around the world, there are corporations that are wanting to establish a foothold uh, in this space because, again, they can see the potential. They are usually very slow to announce what they're doing. Um, one, because they want to make sure that, you know, everything is, is uh, you know, is foolproof from, from A to Z because uh, they don't want a big, uh, you know, headline splash of negative news if something goes wrong. So they're, they're, these big companies are taking a measured approach into how they're getting into it. But there is serious capital going behind it. And I, I can tell you that there are a lot of, of, of very prominent people in the, the industry that are, uh, are on board. Uh, and, and at least are starting to point themselves in a direction to start moving in a big way uh, towards seeing this, this, this space be successful and be developed. Ron, do you still have your hands up? I, I do, I have one more Baxter, I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna attack different a, a little bit. One of the things we spent a lot of time looking at um, is, is correlations, and there was this hypothesis for a long time that 
crypto assets and digital assets would be negatively correlated against the equity market. So it was a great from a portfolio management and allocation perspective. Um, we're starting to see some data that suggests they're a bit more correlated than not correlated. Do you have any mm -hmm. insights on that or any thoughts? You know, I think that, that you know, over time, they probably will become more correlated just because uh, you're getting a bigger and bigger, you know, investment base into to Bitcoin. So it starts, it starts moving around differently. I think also as you start seeing more and more ways to invest into crypto, it's going to, um, you know, affect, you know, how money flows in and out. Um, it'll become, you know, an asset just like, like, like any other. Um, and so that will probably increase correlations. In fact, I've actually got a slide on, you know, kind of how uh, those digital assets, and in this case, you know, Bitcoin has, has worked over the years. I mean, yeah, the, the correlations uh, were very low and could, um, from a, a portfolio management standpoint, really improve your risk return types of, of, of metrics by, by holding it, and despite all the volatility that it displays just because of the way it moved around relative to some of these other, uh, you know, holdings in, in a portfolio, it kind of smooth, smoothed out your ride uh, over time. Um, again, as more and more people start getting involved in it, um, it will probably have a, a higher correlation with, with other assets, but I still think it, it's something that's very different. From, uh, you know, again, whether it's stocks or bonds, it's just, it's different, it's global. It's, uh, it's also something that, you know, the, the, the supply is fixed. So I think that there is that whole inflation hedge um, element to it that hasn't really had to be tested uh, so far. You know, we've been going through a period of, uh, you know, historically low inflation over the last decade. Um, if inflation rates really start going out, and Bit Bitcoin should have a, a, a real chance to prove itself. And, and that would, uh, in theory, make it, a decouple in terms of uh, its correlations with other assets. Great. Thank you, Baxter. Yeah. And also interest rates would be another thing, you know, rates are, are extremely low. And so um, that's, that's, that's kind of made assets have a, have a, a little bit different of a, uh, a behavior than they, they, they would have in, uh, in previous cycles. Yep. Looking for yield in the most unlikely places. Uh, People anyway. Exactly right. Anyway, so, Big, I think big, we have come to the top guy. of the hour. Yeah, Baxter. Yeah, I mean we haven't even talked about D five. Maybe maybe you you should come back. Uh, you know, in a month or so when D five would have uh, you know changed, uh, transmogrified even further. Um, Lot, lots of exciting stuff happening in that space. I mean, my, I, I think there's a, an incredible amount of potential. My worry is that, you know, because it is unregulated, it is the wild west. Uh, you know, I, I'm hoping they're not going to be any, any kind of blow ups that can, can attract, a uh, kind of sensations. Swap? That, you know, the Mount the Mount Gox swap? hacking. Or, <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, oh gosh, you, you read these crazy stories almost every day about stuff that's going on in, in this space, but, yeah, they're, they're people that are that are making money, um, but then, then then there are all kinds of questions about where the money's coming from and all that. I mean, it's 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 like any new new technology. You know, when the internet first came around, you know, I remember people would say, you know, I can't believe you you know you put your credit card on on that thing and bought you know whatever it was that you bought. I heard about a lady getting her credit card hacked, or you heard about you know a dictator in Central Africa putting his money in a in a bank in in Caribbean. I mean. Same kind of stories then that are, that are happening now. So it's just a kind of history, not repeating itself, but, but showing similar patterns. All right. It's been a delightful hour. Um, unless uh, anybody else has uh, stuff uh, that they want to talk about. But next week, uh, we are going to have uh, Eugenio Reggiano talking about DCEP. And... Uh, the latest news on DCEP, of course, can be picked up uh, in Kiffmeister's uh, Chronicles, uh, as always. I monitor that every day. Uh, Thanks for that plug. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so, you know, the whole point is that uh, next week uh, we are going to have Eugenio talk about DCEP, which seems to be going ahead uh, full, full bore. And um, 
he lives in Shanghai, so he has a better view of this than most of us. Uh, uh, anyway, until next uh, next time, which is two weeks from now, uh, it's been uh, great. Thanks for showing up. Um, we keep on trucking. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.